and welcome to the Psychiatry and Psychotherapy Podcast. I'm here to talk about getting rid of burnout, increasing job satisfaction, and feeling like an expert in what you do. One thing that created a lot of burnout and angst for me was trying to get continued medical education right at the last minute. So why not join the CME membership and do CME while listening to this podcast? Go to psychiatrypodcast.com, sign up, sign in, take the test, and the certification is emailed to you in seconds. All right, welcome back to the podcast. I am joined today with Dr. Francis Stevens. He is a PhD level psychologist. He did some further a further fellowship post back work in neuroscience, and he has written a book called Affective Neuroscience in Psychotherapy: A Clinician's Guide for Working with Emotions. And I am excited to have you on. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. I always love talking about psychology, talking about this book. Yeah. So this is, um, so the basic gist of the book is a focus in psychotherapy on emotion. Yes. And six steps, helping a client through this process, emotional awareness, mindfulness. So becoming aware of your emotions, emotional validation. So validating your client's emotions, uh, helping a client develop self-compassion, but step three, step four is understanding the nature of emotion. So not just kind of like distracting away from the meaning of the potential, why they're having this emotion. And then moving in step five to emotional rec- regulation, coping with emotion. And finally, in step six, affect reconsolidation. And so big picture kind of like, I like to start out with that, just kind of let, let my yeah. audience know what they're in for. So you, you're kind of your central drive is emotion. And I'm curious as a neuroscientist, it seems like it's a very cognitive field, you know, your, your post back in neuroscience. It seems like you kind of came in to a world that was heavy in, you know, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, where there was a big focus on thoughts you did like a year of psychodynamic stuff, focus on insight. And then you kind of like had this turning point. Tell me about that turning point and when you kind of realized emotion was more important for you to focus on. Yeah, so like in my master's degree, like many people I was training kind of cognitive behavioral therapy and my PhD was more kind of psychodynamically focused. But both of these kind of uh, treatment approaches really focus on cognitions, like with... Um, psychodynamic there, it's an insight trying to understand your childhood and that makes a change. And, you know, with kind uh, of behavioral therapy, it's changing your cognitions, which is supposed to make you feel better. And I found that neither of these approaches were, were quite, were kind of lacking, were that effective. You know, psychotherapy is effective, but if you look at the studies, the effect size is actually quite low. So I kind of did like a deep dive into the neuroscience and really trying to understand like what's going on in the brain. And, you know, if we really look at kind of like the basics of the brain and try to, you know, boil it down, like the, our, our limbic system, our cerebellum, like kind of the, the basic parts of our brain are very much based in emotion. And so emotion drives a lot of our thoughts and behavior. And if we look at the psychological research and I, I just wrote a paper kind of re-examining like this idea, this does cognition really change emotion or can we change emotion with itself? And so I think we need to kind of shift our interventions in psychotherapy from less like, okay, let's think about the problem differently to let's deal with emotion directly itself. And I found as a practicing psychologist, when I do that, my outcomes for patients are much better. And so I didn't set out to write a book. I wasn't like, oh, I want to write this. I was like, this is something that's really important. And I really want to get the word out there. And I can explain it through affective neuroscience, how much, how important emotion is. Okay. So... You're like seeing clients and you're starting to think through like, there's something I'm missing. Yeah, I would be like trying to reappraise the cognition or think about it this way. And they'd be like, yeah, I mean, I know I'm not supposed to hate myself, but I do. And I'd be like, hmm, yeah, well, I guess you do know, but you still hate yourself. And then sometimes you'd be like, well, you know, I know why I hate myself. It's because my parents invalidated me and, you know, treated me horrible. And, but I still don't like myself. And it's like, yeah, so what do we do now? And I find myself kind of getting that stuck point several times with, with patients. It's like, they know what their problem is. Uh, they know that their thinking is maladaptive or, you know, that their thinking is not aligned with how they feel, but they still can't change those feelings. 
Okay. So, so you're sitting with these clients, they're, they're feeling stuck. They have this knowledge, but no emotional insight into kind of like how they can change this. And so you're in this like quandary. And so you kind of are trying to reassess like, well, what am I, what, what do I need to focus on? Was, was it a journey for yourself as well? Like it was, there, yeah, definitely like in my own training and, you know, I feel like even sometimes, and I mentioned this in the book, like I may have kind of shamed clients in some ways to be mm. like, well, how come, you know, if you're, if you think this way, can't you just tell yourself to feel differently or, you know, shouldn't that, because that's the, the ABC model, the that's the way it should work. And uh, I realized that, you know, we can have all sorts of insight and we can understand ourselves, but we can still be, you know depressed or neurotic. I always talk about Woody Allen. I mean, that guy's been in therapy for years, right? But still very neurotic, you know, not addressed in the emotion, has all this cognition, understands why he behaves the way he does, you know, uh, has great insight, but isn't, uh, is unable to change how he actually feels. Well, yeah, I'm sure Woody Allen, after hearing this, will reach out to you and, and you, can, reach out to me. <laughs> you can work the next 10 years. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come him. see me. And, uh, no, but okay. Coming back to like your, uh, frustration towards yourself, having said some of these things, your patients experience shame, you recognize your patients experiencing shame and you're like, oh shoot, that's not, yeah, this isn't working out. That's not working. And so you're kind of going back to the drawing board in your mind on what could be a better way of approaching these things. What would you say to that earlier version of yourself to mm. when in the midst of that frustration, having had well, a that patient there's another that, way, right? Like I had just kind of taken on a lot of these theories of psychotherapy, kind of carte blanche, right? Like this is just what you're supposed to do without thinking like, wait a minute, there might be a better way here. And then you know, through training and, you know, kind of reading about some people like Leslie Greenberg and Diane Fosha that kind of do more emotion focused therapies and things like that. I started seeing, oh, there's kind of a different approach to this. Um, and my internship was more interpersonally focused. So I was like, oh, this seems to be like, have a different effect here. Like when you just kind of join the clients with, with what they're feeling, it seems to be helpful. But I, but I'm a very kind of analytical person. And I'm like, well, I want to understand exactly how this works. Not just like we sit there with our patients and we feel, we talk about our feelings, we feel better. Like, what is the mechanism behind this? And so then we start looking at the, the neuroscience behind it, like memory reconsolidation, which has been, you know, really uh, identified in the rodent population now being applied to human population. You can see how the brain changes, how the wiring changes when you pair emotions. Okay. Yeah. So you yourself were very cognitive. You would. Yeah, oh, I'm a very cognitive, like, yeah, I'm not a, I was never a touchy feely person till I kind of discovered this. Oh, man. Yeah. As you say that, you have this like a rea um, an expression of like, like emotions were not something that you like enjoyed sitting with, maybe. Oh, yeah. I think for myself, uh, I was never good at sitting with emotions. I was kind of always trying to, like, all right, what, what's, what's the plan here? Like, what am I going to do? And, you know, only through really understanding the science of it, I think that's helped me sit with, understand, be more self-compassionate to my emotions because I'm saying, oh, this is actually what works. It's not just like a uh, fooey gooey or whatever you want to call it. At first you felt like it was fooey gooey. <laughs> well, at first, like, I, want, I want like a science explanation, right? I want to understand why is it that, you know, because it's counterintuitive for most people, right? Like I'm sad. Why would I want to talk about my sadness? Like that's, seems counterintuitive like it doesn't feel good and so i want to understand well what is that and so you know what i tell people is like you know um everybody you know gets upset you know they have someone dies you feel sad but what happens is, is like you don't want to deal with that sentence you put a lid on it but you're still sad now you're in kind of a dissidence you're fighting yourself it's it's suffering study buddhism so what we as therapists need to get a lid off that allow ourselves to have our feeling accept it and when we accept it deal with it, it passes no longer in that state of tension, which results in depression, anxiety, psychopathology. Okay. So, so yeah, it's, it's, so you yourself kind of had to grow personally, oh, personally sure, yeah. to do, to kind of make this uh, shift. 
in your mind, you started out kind of thinking you were going to save the world with these, you know, CBT kind of like, okay, I'm just, if I can just help them think their, think their way out of it, it just kind of like roadblock after roadblock. And so you're kind of going through this like phase shift. Um, did you have any like mentors or guides in the midst of that? Sure. I mean, I had a lot of, uh, you know, I've been to therapy myself. I've had great supervisors. I've done all sorts of different things and that's all helped me in different ways. It's hard, you know, to point out one person there. I mean, I remember I had Dagmeyer Kaufman as a supervisor at the University of Rochester and really saying, Hey, let's look at this differently. And then I'm like, you know, it's kind of interesting. So you pair that with like my next supervisor, which was Catherine Tabor at the VA in South North Carolina, who's more like the neuroscientist and putting those two together, that's kind of the affective neuroscience piece. Like, so how do we put this emotion in the context which you can understand it? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, just doing all these different experiences, like I trained at the, like at the Boston Institute for Psychotherapy or, you know, and learning all about that, you see all these different perspectives, then you're able to kind of put it together in a way that makes sense. And I think the kind of the overwrapping thing is, is the emotion. Yeah, you're, yeah. yeah. And so with the, um, with the emotion and with that journey, how much more were you able to access your own emotions in session maybe, or when, when someone else was having an emotion in session, like, have you, do you feel like you can feel their emotions differently than you used to be able to? Yeah. I think I have a better distinction between what my emotions are and maybe what the patient's emotions are, because you know, as I've been able to sit with and recognize and understand my feelings better, then I'm able to kind of make this distinction between, you know, what might be my feelings, you know, what, or what might be a feeling from the past and what might be coming from the patient. Okay. So one story I like to talk about is I used to work at the VA and uh, I had people, with, guys who come in the road rage, you know, they drive someone off the road, some little lady pulls out in front of them and they want to run them off the road. And so they had all this anger. And they would often blame their anger. Like, oh, I just got to get rid of my anger. My anger is the problem. You know, I don't like it. You know, I just need to be less angry. I'll be fine. But if I can get them talking, you know, we find out this anger has been with them a long time. It's not just this one incident. You know, that they're angry from things that happened to them in childhood, angry from going to wars they want to go to, doing things in wars they want to do. And so they had a good reason to be angry. And what happens is if someone pulls out in front of you, we all get a little bit angry, right? It activates us all, uh, you know. Yep. It's upsetting, but it would activate this whole kind of wellspring, all this anger for them. And so they would go into a rage. And when you're in a rage, of course, you want to run the person off the road. But all this anger was not about the woman that pulled out in front of them. It was all their anger from the past. So for me, training in this and learning about this, I start to understand, okay, where is this like my past emotions like that's coming into play? You know, that maybe it's like, oh, patient criticizes me and I don't like to be criticized. So I'm upset. And then I'm getting mad at the patient. It's like, no, that's me. Like, that's all about me. It's my feeling. You know, it's nothing to do with them. So I'm able to sort that out. And so with, when I work with the veterans, it was to see like that anger is not germane to the current situation. That anger is from the past. You know, we need to treat that differently. We don't want to go after the person. And so then you start to understand where your feelings come from. Like, oh, that's, that's from the past. Or that, that's actually, you know, someone's in the environment is causing that. Yeah. No. Yeah. I like how you talk about it. Um, emotion is a, an adaptive thing, even if it seems maladaptive presently, like it served an adaptive role or serves an adaptive role. Yeah. Um, so anger is like an adaptive thing when someone crosses your boundaries. Again, with these veterans, what happened was they never had a, they were never to uh, utilize or access their anger. They felt powerless in those situations when they were in the military or as a child. And so they just kind of held on to that anger. Now, at the moment, the anger was adaptive because it was like saying this isn't okay. But now the anger is kind of maladaptive because it's coming out towards this person on the sh uh, that pulled out from in the street. And so the emotion itself is adaptive, but when it's misattributed to a different situation, you can sometimes kind of over uh, respond or have an exaggerated response because of that emotion. So you have to be able to kind of identify where the emotion is coming from to deal with it effectively. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I like I like your focus on empathy, validation, validating their emotion. So, like, let's say that one person was like, "Yeah, I hate myself," and I I I know it's because of my childhood, and I don't know how to stop hating myself. Like, what what would be the validation? What would be the empathy you would have for them in that moment now? 
Yeah. So there's a really tricky thing that goes on here because I think there's a lot of impetus and clinicians to be like, okay, like get rid of that thought, like, or like, oh, um, you know, it's wrong to hate yourself. Don't do that. And so then they're like, oh, but that's how I feel. And they feel shame around that. When I've worked with patients that have had problems like this, that hate is usually an adaptive mechanism. So for example, say, you know, kids that were traumatized as children, right? You know, maybe they were abused or something, right? They don't have any control in that environment because they're kids. But a way to control that is to take ownership of that. So it's like, oh, if I don't spill the milk again, I won't get abused. Or if I do this differently, I won't be abused, right? So they take, uh, they try to control that by hating part of themselves. They hate the part of themselves that's been abused or makes a mistake and they can get rid of that. Then they can control the environment so they won't be abused again. So that self-hate serves a very adaptive function there, which is to get rid of the part of you that's causing the abuse. Well, it's, 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 it's a delusion. It's not real, right? Because the child's not causing the abuse. The adult is. But at that young age, you don't realize that. So you end up blaming yourself. And when you work with that, you don't want to be like, oh, what's the matter? Don't hit yourself. Don't, don't do that. Don't beat yourself up. Because it's like, oh, but this is what I've done for so much. It's been adapted. You want to empathize with them, help them understand that, oh, that was an adaptive response then but it's not helpful now. We want to let go of that response. We want to love ourselves. We want to love that part of that self-hate to say, hey, you know, you're okay. Like um, what you went through wasn't okay. You know, you're fine. You don't have to hate yourself. And when they can do that, then you can see a shift and they can start to love all themselves and not have this bifurcation occasion here. Yeah, yeah. I think I think I like to see where dissociation fits into it. And I think there's something about shame. In the shame. extremist sense, you get different personalities. You get total uh, identity well, disorder. Because they have to no, part of, part of the I, I mean, I'm a little bit hesitant to think of it as like a different personalities. But what I'm talking about is like, like let's say that trauma happened to that, that kid. And when they're feeling that shame, it's like, okay, they can either attack back, which gets them in more pain or puts them at more risk or they can just kind of go numb, dissociate, disconnect from reality. And um, in the midst of that shame, in the midst of that dissociation, I often see that shame so prevalent, mm. but the dissociation I see as like the adaptive mechanism to basically protect themselves from getting hurt worse. You know, like if someone's, yeah, something's horrible is happening to someone, it's like, so they take that, that anger is being dissociated or like pushed down or, and then kind of directed at themselves because it's most adaptive to. So that, I don't know, that's, I see it a little bit differently than how you vert, but I think we're on the same page with what you would do with it is to empathize or to, hey, it's, it's adaptive to do that in that situation. Yeah, I mean, often that part, that self-hate gets cut off, right? You don't want to have it, it's dissociated from. So it can be hard for people to even recognize that that's part of them. The feelings seem to come out of nowhere. The, 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 the anger. Feelings. Yeah. Yeah. The anger will, will be intense. And sometimes it comes out at the therapist because it, you're the safest person in the room. Sure. Yeah. So sometimes that anger gets pointed at me, which I'm actually enthusiastic <laughs> when that happens because at least <laughs> it's, be. it's not being yeah. dissociated. Yeah. 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 So it's like a good step. Also, what you said. So you're okay. So you jumped from like the emotional awareness becoming aware of the anger, emotional validation, step two, validating. Which is like your anger is real. So sometimes when they have that anger towards you, right, then they feel guilty. They're like, oh my God, I shouldn't have done that. My anger is so bad. It's like, no, that anger is real. Let's validate that. Now, maybe it's not a good idea to yell at me, but like, let's honor and validate that anger that you feel. Right. Okay, yeah. so that's, the, that's how you do the emotional validation. The self-compassion, go through that again. Like what is in your mind being compassionate towards yourself so compassion involves like um being with your emotions i think like if you break down the latin it's like come is with and pat die is something like emotion but it's like to be able to be like you know what it's okay for me to be sad it's okay for me to be angry like i'm human like i'm gonna suffer i'm gonna have struggles like it's okay for me to have these feelings i can be kind to them yeah, okay. I have self hate. Like, I don't like that, but that's what it is. Let's let's be kind to it. You know, let's not um, get mad at ourselves for hating ourselves. That makes it worse. That draws us further away from ourselves. Yeah, 
I like that. I like, um, it's kind of like um, the emotional validation that we have for them gets internalized. So they believe it. Yeah. Yeah. And when you can start doing that, these are the steps Then you can start to really care for those, those feelings that are so difficult to care for. And then understanding um, the nature of emotion. So then kind of like them understanding the cause and you talk in the, you talk about not distracting or doing necessarily like a, like a mindfulness activity to decrease the intensity of the, the anger that they might feel, but to like more understand it. Is that, is that what you would say? Is that all of these things kind of work in flux. You're always, as a therapist, you're always want to get like a moderate level of arousal that's to be most effective. So if people are dissociated, you want to activate feelings. You want to ask them about themselves. You want to help them feel their feelings. People are overwhelmed. You want to do like coping mechanisms, like deep breathing, you know, count to 10, slow down, because if they're overwhelmed, they're not going to be able to integrate and process these emotions. So you need to always want to go for that moderate level of awareness. And you may have to do one intervention, the other, depending upon where the patient's at. Okay. Yeah, that's, um, that makes sense. You mentioned in the book, you often will say to a patient, you can't change your feeling. You can only change how you respond to your feelings. Tell me about that line. Yeah. So a lot of people, I think with this kind of therapy is like, oh, if I just think differently, I should be able to change my feelings. Now you can change about how maybe you take things personal or how you look at a situation. But if you feel depressed or you feel angry, you can't change that feeling. You can just make it go away. So you can't change your feelings, but you can change how you respond to your feelings, which is like, okay, I don't have to act out with my anger or I can be uh, kind to my depression. How we respond to it is going to then subsequently change what happens next with the emotion. You know, it's going to feel safer to express. It's going to be able to work through it. So then you're able to move towards like a a memory reconsolidation or you're able to actually work to change the emotion when you can allow yourself to have it and be okay with it. Okay. Yeah. So this kind of comes back to that. You you talk about how memory changes every time you access the memory. That's Um, where the research is pointing that we never seem to have the same memory twice. Right. So, okay. So, would you say that the goal is to change the memories over time? Do you think that's like the mechanism for what is? Imp- yeah, I don't like, like the term memory reconsolidation. So I've been calling it affect reconsolidation because as therapists, we're not really trying to change the memory so much as we're trying to change the emotional nature of it. So it's not like we're trying to like, oh, let's forget your trauma or change the memory of your trauma. We want that to stay the same. What we want to do is to change the memory where something that's, overwhelming is okay. Or uh, something, me being worthless, now I can experience a sense of worth. Yeah, I'm working with this one client right now and we're, um, it's like the memory is is moving from dissociation to anger. And so in the dreams, she's standing up for herself Good. in ways that she wasn't before. So in b- before she would take a more passive, you know, acquiescing role to the, to the person who traumatized her in dreams. Now she's yelling at the person, standing up against people. It's still distressing for her. She, you know, it's like, I want this to be gone. I want this person to be purged out of my mind, which she's entitled to. But it's, I, I see it as a great movement forward. It's like the memory, in the memory, the way that the memory is represented in the brain, which is now being represented in dreams in different ways with different facets but it's it's being represented in dreams she's it's like that there's a a movement into a different style of emotion right yeah it almost makes me think that like elizabeth kubler ross stages of death and dying where you have to kind of go through these emotional stages before you can finally get to acceptance and be past you know your past trauma or whatever major life event you went through yeah yeah, I, I see that. I see um, numbness, disconnection, yeah. moving, moving through anger, the first disgust. First step or, like denial, right? It's like, uh, you know, this didn't happen. And then maybe you start feeling angry. Yeah, I would put, den- I, I, yeah, denial and dissociation. It's like it's like more of a, um, a, a de- the defense mechanisms that sort of keep it from your conscious awareness, right? And, yeah. and even, even um, you know, as- and That's where your patient started. The patient started there. I think the- when you first tell family members about trauma that may have happened to you when you were young, they also start there too, which is disorienting to clients. Yeah, yeah. Like to when the when the family members deny that that took place, oh, that couldn't have taken place. It's like 
yeah, it took place it, because, but it's hard for you to consciously bear witness to that because sure, it's so distressing. Sure. I think that's that's the defense mechanism we all have is that our first response when we hear something overwhelming is to deny that that's the reality. Yeah, yeah. And then, okay, so let's see. I really liked the practical solutions to emotions that you talk about. For example, anger, you talk about how forgiveness is a practical solution. Can you tell me a little bit about what forgiveness is or how you bring that up with clients or what what that means? I've done an episode on forgiveness, but I think... It's always good to hear someone's sort of own journey yeah, so with what that means. Forgiveness and self-forgiveness. And I want to talk about both of them. Forgiveness means to forgive, which means to give back, right? So if someone hurts you and you're angry, you know, ideally you want to give that anger back to them. That's their hurt. They did that to you. Like you, you don't have to suffer. You should forgive it. Give that back to them. Like that's their problem. That's their hurt. You don't, you don't deserve to hold on to that. And when you can recognize your anger, I mean, when you're, your patient can start to accept her anger more. She can start to forgive her parents who ever hurt her and give that back to them. That's not her fault. She did nothing wrong. That was about them. But oftentimes, sometimes even with, with forgiveness comes self-forgiveness because sometimes patients, like maybe your patient blames themselves or they feel responsible or they said, I should have done something different. So that involves self-forgiveness, which means you want to give back that you know shame or that anger you know, I, I messed up. I, I was, uh, I did something bad when I was younger. I want to give that back to my old self. All right. I want to forgive that, but that's harder to do because it requires kind of a second step, which is to really engage in self-forgiveness. You have to change as a person because that shame there, that guilt, which is about behavior is a way to keep your behavior in check, right? If I feel shame about, you know, like my drinking, okay that's going to keep me from drinking more, which is ostensibly a good thing. But then I'm carrying on this burden of shame, which doesn't feel good. So I really want to forgive myself. I have to say, okay, I'm a different person now. I don't need to drink to cope with my emotions. I have a better way to handle things. And then I can really forgive my shame because I don't need to use that shame anymore to regulate or control my behavior, control who I am. So we can change as people. We can recognize why we made the mistakes we did, why that occurred. Then we can let go of that guilt, shame, anger, sadness, whatever we have, back to our old self because it won't happen again. Yeah, when I look I look at a lot of the forgiveness literature, I look at like Enright. I don't know if you've read any of Enright's forgiveness literature. He's like the, he's written all these books on it. And uh, so I think it's, I've never heard that you you just start giving it back to the person. I think of forgiveness as like you are doing it for yourself because it, you know, you realize like, yeah, it's for it, you too. It's, it, it's it's most beneficial for you to let this go, in a way. You know, whether you're 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 not saying that the thing was right. You're saying actually, no, this was very wrong. What happened to me was wrong. A lot of people get messed up when they think that forgiving is yeah. just saying that. Oh, it's it's I okay. Yeah. I'm I'm okay with you doing that. No, it what you did was really wrong. There's, you know, spiritual forgiveness and there's like secular forgiveness. So there's like different uh, mm. practices. Every every spiritual tradition has forgiveness as part of, of uh, they've written about it. So I think it's it's an important thing to look at like across the spiritual traditions and sort of see how it's it's been an important thing because we all don't want to just get stuck in the cycle of bitterness and anger chronically. Yeah, that can happen when we don't forgive. Yeah, so yeah, it's a journey. And I think it's, I have empathy for people who have a hard time forgiving because it's very difficult. And so it sometimes- is. I think you kind of uh, put your finger on it when you said oftentimes, I think when people forgive, they assume that that means that the behavior is okay or that I'm, you know, I'm saying that that's fine, which is not it. You know, it's not, it's not, you know, justifying what they did. Forgiveness is all about for you. And it's letting go of your pain because you don't deserve it. You didn't do anything wrong. Yeah. You know, um, so when I went through psychodynamic training, I, my main supervisor, Dr. Tarr, was very focused on emotions, actually. He came out of more of, I think he kind of went through a journey, like you said, like it, there was a very sort of analytic mm. cognition time frame, but then with the inner subjectivists and... Franz Alexander, the corrective emotional experience. My, so this guy was actually taught by Franz Alexander. Oh, um, okay. 
So a lot of therapists are saying that memory reconsolidation, which I just talked about, is very similar to what they would refer to as that corrective emotional experience, that those are actually kind of the same thing. So the way that I understand um, the mechanism of change is the therapist and the therapist's connection with the individual is so pertinent to that. So I think that's where I would like kind of see where, where your thoughts were, if they're, if they're different than that. I think the focus on emotion gets you to the connection, but I think the experience of the patient not feeling shame from you, feeling your acceptance, I don't think it can happen in a vacuum. Like I think if someone's listening to this, like, oh, I'm just gonna do these steps on myself. Like, I don't think that's gonna work very well. I tend to agree with you. I think there's a lot of implicit processes that we don't necessarily articulate or have the words for. You know, when when you when a baby's born, you pick up that baby, you know, you look at that baby, that baby's crying. What you often do is you like, you kind of like match their expression. And then you're kind of like, it's okay too. You know, then you kind of smile and hold them, right? So what you're doing is you're joining them, you're validating their feeling, and then you're kind of regulating it by saying it's okay. And I think we do that non-verbally with our, our patients all the time. Is they're like, oh man, like wow, you're really angry. Like we're expressing that, maybe even a little exaggerated mm-hmm. in some ways. Whoa, that sounds awful. And then we're like, but it's okay, breathe, we're all right. And then so we're kind of like mirroring them, matching them in some ways. And that really helps them learn to uh, express and regulate their emotion in an implicit process that's pretty hard to just put into words in a book of how you do that, right? Right. So these implicit right brain to right brain, often attachment type of things. And so like, um, I, I, I think with the anger, I don't know if I would say to a patient though, it's, it's all right. I would say you're, you're entitled to be angry and I would be okay. Just, I mean, just like you're saying, like with the self emotional validation, just sitting there and just being like, let's, let's like, what does that feel like in your chest? Yeah. Let's be angry. That, that tightness, tell me what that tightness would say. I, I found like there's some some links between your approach and schema therapy. Um, I don't know if you've dug much into schema therapy, but it's kind of like an offshoot of CBT, like the people who felt like CBT wasn't working. So they developed like schema therapy to deal with these more like emotional processes. And they go back to the memory and they like, they enter into the person's so they, you know, like, let's say a person was driving and they got angry. They might say to the person, when was a time in the past that you felt similar? And then, oh, this memory of when I was a kid and this happened, right? And it's like, okay, that's the memory. Then they go in and they look at the emotions. They they try to enter into it with the person in like kind of a corrective emotional experience way. So it's kind of similar to what you were saying. I don't know if you have any reflections on how you would differentiate your, your line of thinking and schema therapy. It's okay if you don't. Um, but it seems like you both, that you're kind of joining the, the patient, right? Like you're validating yeah. what they're feeling, you know, which is kind of like the, uh, similar to the process. I think you're aware of it. You're validating it. Maybe having some compassion where like, wow, it's hard to feel that way. Regulating it in some ways where it's like, okay, we can feel that way and be all right. And then maybe trying to like work with it. Like, all right, like, can we, you know, feel that anger and also allow ourselves to be calm. You know, can we, maybe we need to set a boundary uh, with that anger. You know, uh, maybe we need to forgive someone with that anger. Like, what do we want to do with it? Right. It's like, um, yeah, the anger often will lead to a visceral desire for a boundary, right? Or visceral desire for having a voice in a situation. Yeah. What about like emotionally focused therapy? You mentioned it. You mentioned how it has some influence on you, kind of like this focus of emotions. Like, is it, how is that different? How is that similar from your processing of how things work? Yeah. So it's very similar in that, you know, the the focus on emotion and not kind of behavior or cognitions or insight, like some other therapies. What I might say is different about my approach is that it kind of like outlines the steps a little bit more. And so you can kind of like see a little bit more kind of how to go through it. And it kind of provides some specific interventions. So emotion focus is kind of its own thing, 
where you could be like a cognitive behavioral therapist or whatever and kind of integrate some of the techniques that I'm kind of right. presenting. Yep. And emotion focus is all about kind of being able to express that emotion and, and have it. But it doesn't really talk through like um, the more kind of specifics, especially say like the, the neuroscience of like, well, why do we want to match the emotion? Um, when do we want to maybe set a boundary of forgiveness or utilize that emotion? And that, you know, I think it's probably just kind of like another building block on top of all these like ways to do therapy. Yeah. 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 What do you think of the, um, the, these studies that look at like common factors, right? So it's like, it's not necessarily a modality that makes a difference. I, I, um, Oh, that totally fits in line with what I've been talking about because these studies are saying, well, the interventions don't matter so much, but the interventions are like cognitive reappraisal, you know, uh, some sort of like insight. The common factor is like the therapeutic alliance, right? It's like the empathy. And these things are like kind of what I'm talking about in, in the book. And so these common factors, I think are actually, a lot of them are actually really good therapeutic techniques. They're just not identified as such because we tend to think of, therapeutic techniques in cognitive behavioral terms. Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, I had a uh, Stephen Hayes on my podcast talking about acceptance commitment therapy. And then I was like trying to do an intro for it. So I was like looking at like, okay, how does it compare to, you know, CBT and pretty equivalent for depression. And I was a little bit like, okay, I, I'm, I'm missing some study here. And so my buddy, who's like a, he's a psychiatrist. He sent me this meta-analysis, you know, where it's like, it's better, right? And so I looked at all the individual studies and I see the same thing over and over again. It's like, you know, I, I put this I in there. Go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. I think mindfulness is a great therapeutic technique, right? It allows you to be aware of your emotions, which is the first step we talked about. It allows you to kind of, have your emotions, but separate from them. Like the emotions part of me, but it's not all of me. But nowhere in there are you changing the emotion like you are with an intervention like memory reconsolidation or forgiveness. Yeah, I like how you differentiate those two things because I think a lot of people take mindfulness to the full extent of just continuing to disconnect from all yeah, uh, desire, ridiculous. emotions, now, mindfulness and you're is human, right? Of course, you're going to be hurt. You get traumatized. Of course, it's going to traumatize you, right? right. It's ridiculous. Yeah. I um, the way that I practice mindfulness is actually through rowing. I go rowing every morning, and oh, I cool. really focus in on each stroke. And while I'm focusing on the stroke, I have past traumas come to my mind of rowing races that I lost, or wow. you know, times that coaches yelled at me. Um, I was in like one of the most. I was in one of the top three programs with uh, the coach with the most national championship. So every day it was just like, today we're here to win a national championship, right? So nothing was ever good oh, enough. Wow. So a lot of internal critique, right? So I'm rowing now and I'm having a very different, I'm trying to get to a very different place where I can just like enjoy it, right? Yeah. And focus on each stroke. And then you have all these sort of self-critical thoughts that come into my mind and then I just try to like refocus in on the stroke, but maybe I need to do some more deeper emotional work on that as well. <laughs> well, if you were to take that example, I think that's a great way not to have those self-critical thoughts take over, right? That this is part of me, it's not all of me, right? To recognize that, but it doesn't change the self-critical thoughts. To really change that, you'd have to kind of go back, have that thought and say, okay, I've been told I'm a piece of garbage, but I know I'm not a piece of garbage and repair that emotional experience to be like, you know what? Like I can love myself in that moment. And when you do that, then you can have that memory without feeling so bad. Yeah. 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 I'm starting the temperature is getting a little hotter in here somehow. <laughs> um, that's, that's good. Okay. So um, yeah, I like, I like your initial chapters going through some of the science of it. There was one study that talked about autonomic changes in decision making, I'll I'll link this on my website if you guys are curious. Oh, my gosh. research library. I cited a lot of studies. I'm yep. afraid I remember that one. Oh man, a uh, Yip 2020, and so it was looking at how emotional intelligence moderates the association between physiological measures of somatic markers and risk taking. Oh, okay. 
And so I would, one thing that it seemed to me is that are we, when we're looking at like autonomic nervous system arousal by skin conductance, are we looking at emotion or are we looking at autonomic arousal? Like, are those the same or different things for you? Oh my gosh, this is a great question. It was very insightful. I think that's a debate, right? And so if you look at people like Jak Panska, they're going to say like the arousal, the initial symptom, that's an emotion. You look at people like Lisa Feldman Barrett, it's going to say, no, an emotion is after, later. Uh, there's a cognition involved. You've thought about it. It feels like this, right? So I think this is like an unexplored question that there's no good answer to, even if you look in the science, that like, what is arousal? Is that an emotion itself? Or is that just a physiological response that then yields an emotion or feeling later? So a lot of this stuff like the, is based upon this like shaky bridge study where, you know, um, people went across the shaky bridge and they were aroused and then they misattributed that and they, you know, they liked the Confederate or they didn't like it, depending upon if they uh, uh, were able to attribute that arousal to something else, right? And one time they say, oh, well, their thinking is that they uh, like this person. And so some people interpret that to support this kind of ABC, that your cognition changes your, your feeling model. And some people say, no, the arousal itself is the initial thing that's, that's driving the thinking and that the arousal precedes that. And as I look into this, it's like, nobody knows. It's, it's a hodgepodge. You look in the brain, the cognitions and the motions are all kind of intertangled. Yes, and, right? Yeah. Yes, and uh, probably more. Uh, you know, I think it's like, sometimes when I think about the brain, like you have a great chapter where you sort of summarize, like here's all the different brain circuits. And I'm, you know, I've heard this stuff. And I think, I think there's some interesting research where they look at like, like here's these brains that are lighting up and the correlation is like 0.2 or 0.3 or, you know, associated with depression or, you mm -hmm. know, but then I think like how many, how many neurons do we have in the brain again? And how many connections does the average neuron have? Like some have like 40,000 connections. <laughs> like, so you have like 10 billion neurons, some with 40,000 connections. Like, like, how do you, like, like, are we oversimplifying things? Like, are we- Probably. Are, are we trying to grasp and try to make sense of this thing? And I think, I think it's good that we do that. Like, I love looking at, the, I love reading that stuff. But then I ask myself this question, like, like, okay, my brain can hold three to five things at a time, right? Working memory. Yeah. So we have these brain loops that were like three, three to five things. And, but like some of our neurons have 40,000 connections. Does that ever like, the complexity I, I of it, like if you're asking, do we oversimplify things? I think the answer is yes. I think whenever time you try to take something and put it into an analytical framework, you're you're always losing something. Do I think that's a bad thing? I, I would say not necessarily, because if that can inform us to have better treatment, you know, to understand the brain better, to advance science, then it has value. Now, what we have to be careful of is recognizing that there is an oversimplification. We might be missing things. And to always be willing to kind of go back and question some of the assumptions and axioms we base these ideas upon. Yeah. Okay. So arousal, autonomic nervous system. Um, here's, here's what my sense is, okay? So when I initially have someone talk about something, right away, even before they say words, they flash a micro expression of emotion. Okay. So as, for example, today, as we're talking the moment you talk about this this patient and you said something that made them feel shame, even before you told me that story, you flashed anger on your face. Oh, cool. Okay. We can, you can look back at the video later and watch this. And so I knew there was something frustrating, some anger. Now, if I, th I think if I got you to talk about that for a couple minutes, your autonomic nervous system arousal may go up and you may, you may feel with that a little bit more of that fight and flight, right? That sort of like activation. But if it's too much, like you're saying, like we have to moderate the levels, then you might go into dissociation. So I, I see kind of, I, you know, the polyvagal theory, I think it has some issues, but overall, I like the idea of like, we have this very parasympathetic rest and relaxation state. We have this fight and flight state, which is like 
our hands are maybe a little bit cold. And some people that I meet, they're like chronically in this state and we have to figure out how to get them into that more parasympathetic state. And then I meet some people who are more in the dissociative state, you know, which is like areas, more areas of the brain are shut down. And, and so I think that when you talk about, we need to moderate the intensity of the affect, it's like, we don't want, the, we don't want people to be dissociating, you know, in our office for, at least for too long, like maybe initially as the memory is yeah. brought up, but then I'm looking for where's the emotion, right? Because the emotion pulls them out of that dissociation because they dissociated away from the emotion. So that's my like a thought of that process. You can pick it apart yeah, based so on your research. There's a lot of this research supporting that you want to be in that moderate level of arousal where you don't want the person over the arousal. We have, I mean, there's a, you know, tons of, psychotherapy interventions for coping with emotion and ways to do that. That's very well established. And then, you know, you also want them to dissociate. So you have to bring them uh, online, but you got to be careful because sometimes when you activate that feeling, you get overwhelmed. So it's always kind of this balance. I wrote an article called affect reconsolidation and affect regulation. It's organizing principles. And it's all about like being able to kind of activate emotion, but then also be able to regulate it too at the same time. Yes. Yes. I, I like you, if you, if you, if you don't get to the emotion, I think, it, especially in people who are like a little bit more, um, OCPD, you know, obsessive compulsive personality disorder, they, they may intellectualize away from the emotion. Yeah. They may rationalize away from the emotion. They may have like, it's, it's the intellectualizing, the, the rationalizing are different than how you talk about understanding the nature of the emotion, because it's, it's like, uh, there's a there's an aspect of denial in it or distracting away from it, so it's more of it's they're, they're not in that emotional awareness space yet, which a lot of medical students actually have more of that OCPD because it's it's very adaptive for yeah it's very adaptive for their uh, their journey to, to be, medical school is very competitive all that yeah this uh, high conscientiousness right. Huh. Yeah, so I, I was thinking about that as well as when you were talking about when I was reading your book. And and I appreciate the rigor, the scientific rigor, the citations. I love, I love, love, love a book with like 50 citations after every chapter. It just makes me excited. <laughs> well, one thing I like about this book, I'll give it my plug, is like, I think it can be read at different levels. If you are not a, a neuroscientist, but you're starting out as a therapist, you can read it and still get stuff. But if you want to come back to it and you have an understanding of neuroscience, you can read it and dig into the citations and really start, okay, what is the, what are the mechanisms behind here? What's going on? And so it's a book, I think, that can be appreciated on, on different levels of in terms of just how to apply some of these techniques, you know, uh, how it might fit into how we think about psychotherapy and other modalities. And then also like, well, what's the, what's the neuroscience? What's the hardcore science behind this that's driving why this might work? Right. And I think in your journey, in your hero's journey, it kind of was coming to a place of that initial like, okay, there's something else that I'm missing. There's there's a rigidity that yeah. I'm I'm operating out of. And then I think that your intellectual journey through this material that you've presented here allowed you to sit in those emotions and not be and not and not have a sort of revulsion towards them or like, I just want to get rid of these things, but can I, can I participate and be present with someone else's emotions? Yeah. There's kind of a short autobiographical part in the beginning of the book. Cause I really want to explain like, why am I doing it this way? What is like, where's, what's the meaning for me in this approach? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I appreciate your, uh, your time coming on here and I think we'll have more discussions in the future if there's like articles that come out that are crucial articles for psychotherapy. Sure, and, I love I love talking about this sort of stuff, and you seem very intelligent and know what you're talking about. So it's it's just nice to talk to you. Yeah, and we'll uh, have to I'll have to convince you to learn micro expression because I feel like it's just so powerful to see the emotions and then to know that that person flashed that emotion. I didn't flash the emotion. So I, I've read Paul Ekman's book and I checked out your your page with the micro expression and everything like that, but. And I've knew this before. I'm horrible at it. I this is not my forte. Most people are. And I, I love to get better at it and learn more about it. But like you told me, I flash anger, and 
maybe you flashed micro expressions oh, during I'm this. Sure I, did. I didn't catch any of them. I'm sure I did. I didn't catch any of them because I that's very difficult for me. Sometimes my clients will be like, you're staring at me. I'm like, yeah, I kind of have to to pick up the emotion because it's not a natural thing for me. Well, just even attempting to pick up the emotion, you'll pick up more emotion and you'll empathize more. There's a study that looked at that. Uh, they, had, okay. they had people trying to focus on the videos of emotion versus the video, the, what they were wearing. And they, um, they mimicked the videos they were watching of emotion more if they were trying to focus on the emotion. And these were not trained experts. So even your focus on emotion will lead to you mimicking. And by mimicking, I mean you flashing a micro expression closer to what the person actually had as an emotion. Oh, okay. So even your focus on emotion I think is allowing you to better connect with people. Oh, I think that they, I definitely think I've improved, but it's just not something that comes natural to me. My micro expression doesn't come natural. No, I didn't. I, um, and it doesn't come natural how to use it. And that's where I feel like I've added to the field. And maybe I need your help writing up an article because you're a much better writer than I am. But basically the, the use of the micro expression to mm. um, empathize with the people and connect with them because if, if I just tell someone, and I'm sorry I told you, and I, I imagine it, it stimulates shame or like something like that, knowing that I read your emotion. I didn't intend it to be that way, right? But it's like, if I'm in a session with someone, I don't point out like, oh, I saw your expression of anger. I more empathize with it um, right. yeah. and, and validate it, you know? Because you're entitled to feel frustrated that you were like amongst like wanting to improve your abilities and then you were able to find a way through it you know cognitively you kind of worked out that intellectual puzzle so i appreciate i think that's how i had to do it it wasn't going to come to me in a more natural sense yeah and you yeah and you had some good 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 guides both in the authors and in the the mentors you had so and it's led to you putting out a good piece of material so i appreciate that oh great well Hey, we'll have to leave it there for today and I will talk to you soon. Sure. Yeah, let's be in touch.